All right, hi everybody. Not that many people, but expected with that topic. I never have those big crowds because I'm always too special. Or my topics are too special, not me. Um, well, anyways, thanks for coming. Um, if there's any questions throughout the session, just shout. Um, just with my previous session, I want you to understand what I'm talking about. And not just the words that I say, but the meaning behind it. So, welcome to PowerShell on AWS. Maybe a quick show of hands, don't have to count that far. But um, who's already using AWS or who knows what, first, who knows what AWS is? A couple of hands. Who's already using AWS? One hand. Okay. For the recording, that's one hand out of maybe a dozen. So, is anybody, are the others using Azure? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. And so, you're using both. Cool. All right. That covered. Oh, my picture's not showing up where well, you can see me. Quick introduction if you've not been to my previous session. Uh, my name is David O'Brien, senior DevOps engineer at Monitor Consulting in Melbourne, Australia. Monitor does cloud virtualization, a um, lot of migration projects from on prem to cloud, and we really don't really care which cloud that is. So if you're choice is AWS, we migrate you to AWS. If you want to go Azure, we migrate you to Azure. If you want to go both, perfect, we do both. Or maybe to Rackspace and into their managed environment. And that's all fully automated. So if we do something, it's automated so that in the end you can do it yourself or take up from where we left. My accent gives it away. I'm not Australian, um, German, Scottish. Um, moved to Australia about two years ago now. My Twitter handle, David O'Brien, so if you've got any questions, um, follow me, send me a question. I'm usually quite good at responding. My blog, david-obrien.net, a bit quiet lately, but if I think something's of interest, I do put it up there. It's my own private knowledge base, just on the internet. I am a PowerShell MVP, or a Cloud and Data Center Management MVP, as we call ourselves now, and also author for PowerShell Magazine. Also, I think I host the most southern PowerShell user group on this planet in Melbourne, unless there's one in Hobart, but I'm pretty sure there's not. So, quick agenda. Um, I'm going to give you an intro, introduction to AWS. After that, I'm going to show you how to get the AWS PowerShell module, because they've got one. And how, what and how can we automate that on AWS? So what can we automate and how do we automate it? And in my very last demo, I'm going to show you how to do all of that from Azure Automation. So um, I think it was Alexander yesterday who said a lot of people confuse Azure Automation's name with, that, with the meaning that it can only automate Azure or Azure resources. He's already proven that that's wrong because of now we've got hybrid workers, so we can automate on-prem stuff. And I can show you that we can automate AWS with Azure Automation. Hoping that my demo works. So AWS, Amazon Web Services, uh, that's the, I think, the Gartner description of AWS. Subsidiary of Amazon.com, cloud-focused, obviously, highly automated, cost-effective, flexible, on-demand. Very marketing fluff, but especially the first one, highly automated. So if you have a look at the UI, it wants you to automate. Um, compared to the Azure UI, the Azure portal, which is pretty and has some slide, uh, tiles that move around, you can drag and drop, um, which makes you want to stay in that UI. The AWS UI 
is a bit different uh, in that aspect. That next point is quite interesting. So AWS, just from a compute perspective, so IaaS, Infrastructure as a Service, is 10 times bigger than the sum of compute of the next 14 competitors. That's a lot. I've not got it in here, but compared to Azure, AWS is already, uh, I think, eight times as big as Azure. That's just for IaaS, just for compute. So, of course, for when we talk about that, we also have to talk about Gartner. Oh, where is it? No, that's a bit too much. So the Gardner Magic Quadrant. Far upright, we've got AWS as the market leader. Beneath that, Microsoft with Azure. And then everybody else is somewhere down there. Very interesting if you have a look at the Gartner report that they release. It's interesting how they, yeah, how they describe all those cloud providers and how they rank um, each one of those against each other, and especially what they value at each cloud provider. Even though it's, some people say oh, it's Gartner, um, it's actually really interesting. All right, so how do we get the AWS PowerShell module? One, there is an AWS PowerShell module. Um, that's already an assumption that I've done. A um, couple of ways. Obviously, the PowerShell package management nowadays. So who's used the PowerShell package management module before? OK, so I'm going to show you that. Open up that again. RDP into my Windows machine for that. Perfect. So for that, we can use find module and say AWS. So what it does, or what PowerShell now does, is it goes out to the PowerShell gallery, the PS gallery repository, and searches that repository for everything that's got AWS in its name. The PowerShell gallery is a NuGet-based repository. So if you've not heard about NuGet, that's package management for Windows. And the way we can install that module now would be via install module, let's say AWS PowerShell. I've already got that installed, so with install, uh, install module, the name of that module, I could now go and just install it. I don't have to download anything manually and then install it. That's the nicest way of installing it. Let's shut it down. There we go. The other way would be to actually go and download it. So AWS has published an MSI on their website, so you can just go and download it and deploy it via some sort of software deployment mechanism, if you like. After that, we can run that get AWS PowerShell version commandlet and see what we can actually now do with that, um, with that module. That module is quite, 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 quite big. <laughs> um, there's 1,666 
don't know if that's coincidence, by the way, 666, um, PowerShell command that's in that one module. Just in comparison, Azure has 756 in a version from, I don't know, two weeks ago, um, which is probably already 0.5 versions behind the latest one, I don't know. But they've got quite a few <laughs> PowerShell commandlets in there. And yeah, you should be able to see that. <coughs> These are all the AWS services that they've got um, commandlets for. There's basically everything in there, especially the second one, CloudFormation, is the one that we're going to have a look at later on. And the, where is it, the EC2, um, EC2 Elastic Cloud um, Compute Service on AWS. And it also shows you from when that version is. So when was the last time AWS has updated that service. So I did a bit of a research internally at our company and asked, so what are the most commonly automated tasks that you do on AWS? Because I'm one of the few Microsoft guys at that company and everybody else is Linux and AWS. So I thought maybe check with the guys that actually use it day on a day-to-day -day basis. And Answer was, we usually do creating, editing, and launching, obviously, of VPCs. So VPCs are sort of like resource groups on Azure. So groups of compute instances and executing CloudFormation. If you're not <coughs> familiar with CloudFormation, CloudFormation is basically what in an Azure world, we call ARM templates, or the, the JSON templates. They already had that a, a while ago. Quite mature. And deploying that JSON template, that's what I mean by executing CloudFormation. And I'm going to demo that in a minute. Any questions so far? <laughs> I don't know. So question was, um, in that picture here, they had, for example, the identity and access management is from 2010. <laughs> All right, yeah, S3, I don't know. where they did have .NET SDKs for quite a while. So it might be that they've just wrapped their .NET stuff into PowerShell at that time. But seriously, I mean, in 2006, in March, the PowerShell public beta was not released. Yeah, that's why, yeah, yeah, so that's why I say they might have already had the .NET stuff, and then they didn't change the version back then. Auto-generating. So they don't have like a, a real developer? No, they, so AWS, so yeah. Okay, question is uh, if they're auto-generating those or if they've got an actual team developing. Yeah, so AWS is actually quite invested in their .NET delivery and they've got an, a dedicated team, dedicated .NET development team for that PowerShell module. So I don't know how many people they have, but they're doing quite a good job, especially around documentation. <laughs> Maybe. No. Okay, so it's written by ex-Microsoft guys. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the documentation is, uh, side of things is also quite good. Hint, hint. Okay. So, demo. When we're talking about working with AWS, the 
the way we work with it, or the concept of Azure, well, one has to be careful. The concept that we know from Azure applies to AWS because they were first, and so, and the other way around. If you know Azure, so that's what I'm trying to say. If you know Azure, you can apply the same concept to AWS to an extent. Like computers compute, right? So you need networking, you need storage, you need some sort of wrap wrapper around it, in this case a VPC or a resource group and all that kind of stuff. There's just some differences that I'm going to show you now, especially around authenticating against AWS. So one quick thing, so that um, you believe me, get command module AWS PowerShell. So there's actually 1,666 commandlets in there. Um, so we've seen that command. Um, that's the command from that screenshot earlier on. So these are all the services that we can script against. I'm only going to talk about CloudFormation now, the CFN. So it's, th this is also quite handy that after executing this commandlet, you can see that beside each service, or next to each service, you see that noun column, and in there you see HSM or CFN. And now you could go and do a get command, noun, and that as part of the noun, and it would already show you only those commandlets. So, for example, CloudFormation, they all start with CFN. And that's consistent across all of those services. They do have a very, very consistent experience across everything. They have a couple of regions across the world, not as many as Azure, have, or Azure has, but apparently enough to be the largest. For my demos, I'm using the Asia Pacific AP Southeast 2 region because that's closest to home. With that get AWS region, you could also specify include China. They do have a region in China. And to be compliant with the government or the US government, they do have a government cloud. So how do we authenticate against AWS? In Azure, we do add Azure account or add Azure RM account, get a pop-up. Um, input our credentials, we're authenticated, and move on. Or we just specify the credentials on the command line. In AWS, because it's historically very Linux-focused, and in Linux you don't usually authenticate with username and password, but with SSH keys, we also authenticate with, S with keys. So, in order to set our credentials in our runtime, or in our run space, or in our shell, we have to use the set AWS credentials commandlet. Give it a name, or give that credential a name, in my case, nickconf, and specify the access key and secret key. That gets stored encrypted in your profile, if you like, and then later on, you can just reuse those credentials. I'm not going to execute that now because I don't want to 
to copy in my um, access key and secret key, otherwise I would have to then go and disable it uh, later after the demo. But in here you can see I've already got the AWS and default credentials in there. So if I now go and say get AWS credentials, profile name, AWS, there's some credential object in there. Every time in this first demo that I'm going to show you, I'd like to provision an EC2 instance, in this case a VPC, so a Windows machine. And in order to do that, I have to create a couple of things first. An EC2 key pair to later on authenticate to that machine. In Windows, that's a bit different. I'm going to touch on that uh, after we've deployed that machine. I have to create a security group, basically an ACL, who can um, access that machine. And from where can we access that machine? So a network ACL. Let's go and create that. So we've now got that security group. You can check the values in here. And we can see that the IP permissions and IP permissions egress are empty and there's some default permissions in there. Especially the IP permissions, that's what we need to set in order to access our machines from anywhere, basically. You can also see that we've already got a VPC ID. And this is where I sometimes say it shows that it comes from .NET, that there's develop actual developers sitting there um, that build those commandlets or build that SDK, uh, because some things are pretty .NET-y, if that makes sense. So in order to build that, that IP permissions uh, property, we have to use these commands. Otherwise, it doesn't work. In production, or when you actually go and do it, I would recommend not using this as your ingress rule, because that basically means everybody can access. So from every IP, I allow people to access my machine. Because I travel around conferences and I have no idea what IP I'm going to get, I use that, but I'm also going to uh, just delete my machine after deployment. So let's have a look at IP permissions. So we've got the from port 3389, IP protocol, um, IP ranges, and two port. Yeah. It's all in the AWS documentation. Okay. Yeah. Can you get that from PowerShell without looking at documentation? No. Is no. There a way to do that? no. Not that I'm aware. So the question was if we can find out without the documentation which get member kind of thing to give you some clues. Yeah. No, I I couldn't find anything. But then again, the documentation is quite good. Um and it tells you in order to build that, use this .NET class, or the, this uh, object class. <coughs> so I've just granted that those IP permissions to that security group. If I no now go and run that get EC2 security group again, oh, and specify the correct name. I can now see those IP permissions. It's been added 
to the IP permissions property. In Azure or on Azure, when we want to build or deploy a machine, we obviously need an image. Same on AWS. And it's a bit easier on AWS now uh, um, compared to Azure, where you have to go, I think, five or six steps just to find out which version of an image you want to deploy um, and build that object. Uh, on AWS, all you have to do is get EC2 image. And I'm filtering that down to um, either my own images that I've baked and uploaded and Amazon's images. Takes a while, because they do have a couple. So I'm now asking the AWS endpoint, please give me all the images you have. And Amazon goes and updates those images for you after, just like Microsoft does. I think they say about two or three days after Patch Tuesday, your image is updated. So if you go and redeploy your machine, you will get an updated version of it. That's not the output that I was hoping for and not the output I got when I ran it last, ran it last time. <laughs> So let's just have a look at this one. Um, even though it's a, a Linux machine, we can see the architecture on top, it's both x86 and 64. Um, we can see that the state is available, which is important because so that means it's the latest machine. Hypervisor Xen, because it's all running on AWS, of course, and the description. So, we now got that huge output, and we now need to filter that down. In here, you could have done, so these are two ways of filtering. You either use that collections generic list filter, so you build your filter yourself, and then pass it into platform and values and platforms like here, or you can also set the filter directly. And that's what I'm going to do now. I only want to get the Windows images. That again is going to take a couple of seconds. Let's see how, that, how long that takes. The, with that information, you then go and get that EC2 image by name. So in here, I would now go and f try to find the name. You can always do a select object, of course. Find the name of the image that I would like to deploy. In this case, it's the Windows underscore 2012 R2 base image that I would like to deploy. And that will give me the information for that image. So you can see on the name that it says that it's updated, uh, last updated on the 31st of uh, December 2015, uh, which is not, yeah, which is not last um, uh, Patch Tuesday. So maybe they've done some. Uh, uh, took a break over Christmas or something like that. I don't know. But the official message is that they usually only take a couple of days after the um, Patch Tuesday to update the images. So with that AMI information, I get that image ID 
up here. And that's the information I need to deploy that machine now. So just as we do it on Azure, where we say new Azure VM, we can say new EC2 instance, pass in the image ID that we just got, min count and max count. So like I said, we are deploying a VPC, like a group of machines, and we're specifying how many machines can live or exist in that VPC. Security group. Is it for scaling? Yeah, it's for scaling. Yep. Yeah. So instance type T1 micro, just how they call it, and we deploy that. You can have a look at the AWS. Uh, UI, so that's the UI. I'm gonna zoom a bit back. And we can see that our instance is now already deploying. You can see it's been deployed into the availability zone AP Southeast 2B, which is somewhere in Australia. We've got an instance ID a public DNS and a public IP. And down here, we can get even a couple more information. So we can see over here our security groups that we just, a security group that we just created, which image has been used, which platform, and which key pair name has been used to deploy that machine. And it's already running. Yeah, that fast. Yeah. Uh, however, I can't RDP into it now um, for whatever reason. Um, something in my deployment isn't a hundred percent right. Um, Oh, that's the status check. Okay. That's just the hypervisor checking. You can already RDP the machine and it will yeah. However, it takes a while. So, if I now want to, and that's coming back to AWS, is a bit tricky when it comes to Windows. We specified that key pair name. In this case, NickConf. That's a key pair that I have to create before. Um, deploying the machine and have to specify during deployment. On Windows, AWS goes and creates a default account, which is encrypted or which uses a password that we don't know. In order to get that password, we now have to say, get Windows password. Okay, we do have to wait a couple of minutes and then have to specify the certificate file, that PEM file that we downloaded after or while creating that key pair. And then we can decrypt the password, log on to that machine, and change the password to a known value. That's just because AWS doesn't let you choose a password during deployment. If you go and bake your own machine, your own AMI, and upload that, then you're full in, con in full control, obviously. But when you're using a pre-baked AMI from AWS, that's how you have to do it. Let's see. There we go. And so I specified that key pair, and now I can, now I could 
RDP into that machine with that credential, with those credentials. Uh, no, you can't do that in PowerShell. You have to actually go there into the UI. Why do you want to RDP into it during fully automated deployment? This is just for RDP. It's only for RDP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to, and that's where AWS is f all about full automation. If you want to configure your machine, you use CloudFormation. CloudFormation can um, execute scripts on your machine while uh, while being deployed. So you could. And you could add the um, ad, sorry, you could add DSC steps. You could add. Um, you could even bootstrap your AWS instance to a zero automation DSC, and have it then automatically upon boot pull the information from a zero automation DSC and configure it accordingly. Question always is why do you want to RDP into it? So if you need to RDP into it because of some troubleshooting, that's how you get your password. I can obviously also remove or delete my machine from PowerShell. So This is my object that was created during provisioning of that VM. And with that information, I can also go and terminate my machine or my instance. Check that in here. It's now shutting down and then removed. So that's the basic EC2 provisioning. However, because it's all about now more automated, more into JSON templates, or on AWS, that's already been there for a while. Wrong way. Oh. I can show you how to do that in CloudFormation. So, like I said, CloudFormation is a let's take that URL. Is it is a functionality or a tool or a product in AWS that leverages JSON files, just as Azure to Azure Resource Manager templates and they basically, I've not tried, uh, I've not compared those two formats against each other yet. Um, that's something I would like to do um, pretty soon, actually, and see what the actual differences between those two are. Um, obviously, there's the schema that might be different and some um, parameter names, but I'd like to see if we can maybe get something out, some automation that or maybe a UI where you can just say, I would like to have this as AWS and this for Azure, and then just deploy from there. So this CloudFormation template will go and deploy a basic Windows Server 2012 R2 via CloudFormation. And the way we do it, that is by specifying a couple of things. Again, just as we had to do before, we have to specify a couple of parameters. For example, from which, um, from which subnet do we want to allow people to access that machine via RDP? So in our JSON template, we've got that parameter, source CIDR for RDP. So we Create that property, param1. And that's something that I have to look up every time that exact syntax 
because there's two ways of doing that. So you can specify the key and the value just as I did here in those three lines, or you do that on the new object line directly. And then it's the property with that property parameter key, and the value is parameter value. Um, so, a bit confusing, but it's two ways of doing the same thing. You add that to params. Now we've got those two parameters in one object. And CloudFormation uses the new CFN stack commandlet, accepts the stack name and the template URL, for example. So we could also have that JSON file or that, yeah, that JSON file locally somewhere or on our own GitHub repository and reference that in here. I'm just being lazy and reference the um, official template or um, testing template um, from AWS. And then specify our params, our parameters with that parameter value. So in here, we can now go to CloudFormation, so in our AWS UI. And it's already in progress. So it's already being created, or about to get created. So compared to the Azure portal, this feels a bit old, but it does exactly what it needs to do, um, which sometimes is something you can't really say about the Azure portal. Um, but they're working on it, and they're always uh, releasing new things. So just as on Azure, w where we can have a look at the deployments, we can now see which steps in our CloudFormation deployment are currently running. And we can also see which template has been used for that deployment and which parameters. So it's all about traceability as well. While this is running, I can obviously go and check if that stack, if that deployment is still running and the status of that deployment. So I can go, or I'm going to go over here into my other tab. Oh, that's because missing a variable. So I can see that in that CloudFormation stack, we've got four logical resources. And out of those four, three are already created. And one is waiting on some other things. In this case, it's waiting for it to boot up and report that it's been created. You can also use the get CFN stack event commandlet, and here we can actually see what it's waiting on and what has been created. Um, we could drill further down into each one of those, but um, looking at the time, just going to skip that. My stack instance it says it's been created now. And that's good, so we should be able to... Mm, maybe the SDK is a bit faster than the UI. What date do we have? Ah, I'm on different time zones here, sorry. <laughs> 
that's the set to um, uh, back at home. <laughs> Anyways, it shouldn't say that it's created when it's not. Ah, yeah. So in this case, I checked for those EC2 instances, and they are created. So just as an example, um, the three EC2 instances, I drill down into one of those now, and they're obviously created, and they've been created at 12.23 a.m. that time zone. So, one quite handy thing is, as I've shown you in the UI, we can have a look at the template that's been used to deploy the machine, get a summary of that template, so what is actually happening, what parameters can we use, and what is that template all about. And something that I think, especially for proof of concepts, is quite, um, sorry, back here, proof of concepts is quite interesting to check how much will that deployment actually cost me over time? So we can execute the measure CFN template cost commandlet, pass in the template and the parameters for that template. Cool. The result is a URL. And I can pass that to Internet Explorer. And it will tell me that if you go and deploy that template with those parameters, the estimate monthly cost in Sydney is going to be $122.98, roundabout. That's actually really handy. So if you want to deploy a template that, I don't know, spits out couple of servers and you have just no idea how much that's going to cost you and have not had a look at the Azure um, cost estimator lately, but that was always pretty flaky. A lot of guessing how many hours, how many um, cores, what type of VM, I don't know. Um, and here we can just pass in that template. That template is getting um, analyzed and it'll tell us, yep, yeah, 122. If it's 130 or 110, doesn't really matter, right? But that's already a good estimate. So, let's see. So it's now created. So complete. Nope. Create complete. Wrong way. And I can now obviously also again go and remove that CFN stack. And it's now in progress. So with that, if there's no questions for that, I would like to jump over to Azure Automation and show you what I've done there. So any questions around AWS, how to handle security credentials, how to handle all of that. Again, it's all very well documented. So just jump onto the um, command and reference website on AWS. And they've got some really good examples there. So, if you've been to Alexander's session yesterday, you might have already seen the um, Azure Automation ISE add-on. Instead of going into the portal, that's all because that's my... Okay, I'm just going to go into the portal. <laughs> Um, 
No. I know, but I still use that. I've used that before. If you have a look here, so I don't know why it's now acting up. Anyways, I can do that. Uh, don't know who came up with that name. Let's see. It's that. Because it always shows you the last um, account that's been used, right? And it, used, uh, it showed my other, who knows. So with that, you authenticate against the automation. And then authenticate, download the runbooks or sync the um, runbooks. And you can check out those runbooks locally. So in here, I've got that new AWS CF stack runbook, which does some basic validation of your input parameters, and basically does exactly what I've just shown you step by step in the ISE, plus some nice output. That code, by the way, is already available on my GitHub account. Um, I can show you that um, account in a minute. So because I don't want to do all that from the, IS, uh, from the Azure Automation portal, I'm going to use the start Azure RM Automation Runbook commandlet, specify the runbook name, new AWS CF stack, pass in the parameters that that runbook um, expects, and a couple of other things. It's got a short timeout. It, I did that. Um, also, that error message is wrong, right? Log in Azure RM account. Yeah. It's just it would be m consistent if there's if they would use Azure uh, add Azure account and add Azure RM account. I know. Uh, so they have both, but the error message, the error message mentions a different one. So authenticate again. A lot of typing. All right. And kick it off again. Yeah, so it's now in progress. So in here, I can now see that that job has already been queued. And it's already running. That's actually quite fast for Azure Automation. <laughs> Very surprising. And I've got some output, or we will have some output. And the nice thing with that is, so I, I don't like UIs. UIs are good for learning. UIs are good to, for troubleshooting. But if I want to do something, I want to, let's say, commit some code and want something to act upon it. And then I want that whatever to tell me what it's doing. So that's why I've built a Slack integration for Azure Automation, which sends a Slack message every time it does something on Azure Automation. So you can see I've done quite a bit before. And the very bottom says it's starting to deploy nickconf. That's coincidentally what I've just called my CF stack. 
as the event stack. It'll go and deploy this CloudFormation stack on Azure Automation. It'll loop through the status of that deployment. I don't need to know that it's after 30 seconds or every 30 seconds still waiting and waiting. I just need to know that it's starting. And if you have a look at 12.47 p.m., that has been created. I don't need to know, or if it fails, it'll also tell me, hey, it failed. I just need to know it started, it worked or it didn't work. And if it didn't work, maybe a basic error message. And then, only then, I need to go into the UI and check why, what output did I get, why did it fail. Otherwise, I really don't need to know. That's just information that isn't of interest. Like, I don't, at least not for me. Yeah, so it's still creating. If we go and check in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, as uh, Alexander just asked, so we obviously need to add the AWS module into Azure Automation. There's two ways of doing that. One, you download the AWS module and upload it manually, which for me always failed because it was just too big. They increased the module limit quite a few times already. I think initially they only had like 12 megabytes and then 20 and now 50 or something per module. The AWS module is, I think, 40 megabytes in size. So if you go to the gallery, so I'm just going to go back and do that again. Let's assume I don't have that AWS PowerShell module in here. I click on Browse Gallery, and it will bring me to the PowerShell Gallery, basically. So before you could have also gone, and you still can go to powershellgallery.com, browse the gallery, and select the module, and then say deploy to Azure Automation. Or in here, search AWS PowerShell or AWS, click onto that module, and up here you can see the import button. Click import, wait a bit. Um, let's see if I've got an example. Yeah, so um, as an example, I could um, <laughs> so GitHub Connect is a module that I've created and uploaded. I still have to do a couple of uh, fixes in there, but it it works. What it does, it helps you do some basic administration on GitHub. For example, create a repository, um, add users to a team, delete a repository, and all that kind of stuff. So click Import, then OK. And it's now importing that module into my Azure Automation environment. So you can see that message activities are being extracted depending on how big your module is, that can take a while. So every module is basically zipped up. It's NuGet in this case, but it's basically zipped up into the PowerShell gallery. And when you go and import that module into the automation, the automation downloads that package and extracts it into your environment. So right now we have zero activities. They sometimes have refresh buttons, not on every tile right now. Here they do. So we can now see down here, GitHub Connect, next to it, Extracting Activities. Click on it, still zero. It did tell us 
that it will take a couple of minutes. So after a couple of minutes, it will show us which, um, which activities it knows about. For example, on AWS PowerShell, all these 1,666 commandlets or activities are available. And I can click on one of them. Let's see. Mm. It used to show you more about it. Anyway, so you can see the description at least. And the description comes from the help out of that PowerShell module. So if you write a PowerShell module, one, it's already best practice, and you should be slapped if you're not following that, to add comment-based help to your mod module. And that description comes from that comment-based help and helps people, especially when they're using the Azure Automation um, online editor and want to add an activity to their runbook. Hey, what is that activity actually doing? Let's quickly go back. It's the thing extracting. Yeah. So where before we had 16 activities, we now, uh, zero activities, sorry, we've now got 16 activities. And I don't always have that. Um, like I said, I do have to fix a couple of things. Um, but PowerShell is intelligent enough to already at least show you the parameters of those. If, there's, if that um, developer, if that guy who created, I have no idea who that was. <laughs> Um, I do have one or two pull requests open on GitHub already uh, for that. Anyways, if that um, isn't there, PowerShell and Azure Automation are going to automatically create some description. Best practice is to use singular map. I know that's something that I have to fix. Um, I so comment was best practice is also to only use singular noun in your, for example, get GitHub pull requests um, or public repositories. I did have my reasons for that. It's not good. Um, I need to work around that. Um, it's just that uh, GitHub works in a very specific way. Um, I was aware of the fact that you should only use singular nouns. Um, that's also the reason why it's still on version I don't know, 0 0.8. So um, but yeah, good, good catch. Always use singular nouns. All right, let's see. And seven minutes after we started the deployment, it's now been created. And we can now just go and uh, update launch new instances into that cloud formation um, environment. Or if we wanted to go in here, and start that delete AWS CF, um, CF stack runbook. That will also, again, take a couple of minutes because we have to deprovision all our network interfaces, the VM, and the security groups. Um, and then our uh, CloudFormation environment should be clean again. So we can refresh that. So automation is a bit slow right now. That's running. takes a couple of seconds. Anyways, so it will now get removed again. Any questions? That's quite squeaky. All right, no questions? Then thanks very much for coming. Um, I think there's one more session after this one today. Um, thanks for having me here in Norway. It was always a nice trip into the north. 
um, even though it's 50 degrees difference, uh, up to 50 degrees in winter difference um, to, what I'm, to what I've got back at home. Um, some contact information in here. That's a PowerShell class, by the way, if you're not aware of that, in PowerShell version 5. Um, very easy to build your own um, objects and classes nowadays. Um, and that's just a nice example to show off, basically. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to stay around for a while. I'm going to go have dinner after the conference. Um, feel free to join if you like. And um, yeah, thanks and hope to see you next year.